Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I do not have anything uh, off the top today, so um, Simon, care to kick Sorry. us off? This is why I don't make predictions on, uh, <laughs> this is why I was hesitant to make one uh, in the first place, but, uh, you know, overall still a phenomenal game. Match. Yeah, um, so uh, I guess we should talk about Niger first. Um, I wonder, you know, the Secretary spoke about it a few hours, well, quite a few hours ago now, so could you give us an update on your understanding of, of the situation there? Sure. So, uh, again, as the secretary reiterated yesterday, uh, we are uh, gravely concerned about the developments in Niger. The situation remains fluid. Uh, we are monitoring the situation closely and continue to be in close touch with uh, the embassy in Niamey. Uh, as you all know, Secretary Blinken spoke to President Bazoum uh, yesterday. Uh, he conveyed the unwavering support of the United States for uh, President Bazoum and Niger's uh, democracy. Uh, he emphasized that the U.S. stands with the Nigerian people and uh, regional and international uh, partners in condemning this effort to seize power by force. He also underscored that the strong U.S. economic and security partnership with Niger depends on the continuation of democratic governance and respect of the rule of law and human rights. I will also note that uh, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Molly Fee, had the opportunity yesterday to speak with Foreign Minister uh, Hasumi and former Nigerian President uh, Isofu uh, to condemn the efforts to seize power, uh, as well as encourage their roles in facilitating uh, negotiations uh, between President Bazoum and the instigators uh, of this takeover. Uh, our CDA, um, Susan Negrim, uh, also spoke with the foreign minister uh, by phone yesterday as well. So um, all to say the U.S. continues to remain deeply engaged on this. We're monitoring and paying attention uh, very closely in touch with uh, officials from the constitutionally elected government of Niger as well as uh, our colleagues at the embassy. And any contacts you can report with the, the people who have attempted this takeover? Uh, I have nothing uh, additional to read out in terms of engagements. Uh, what about contacts with the um, uh, former president, um, Mohamedou uh, Isafu? I just uh, uh, mentioned him as one of the people that Assistant Secretary Fee oh, yeah. uh, had the opportunity to engage with and, yesterday. And, and is he, um, do you have a sense that he is somebody who is, uh, you know, liaising with the, the, the people who've to take over. Uh, I'm not going to just get into the specifics or characterize uh, others' uh, engagements in this beyond the United States, uh, and so we'll just reiterate uh, what I said about uh, our, our efforts here. Thanks. Sure. Um, do you have any information as to the whereabouts of President Bazoum as it stands now? And secondly, uh, are you in a position to suspend aid uh, since obviously it's a coup d'etat? So uh, at this time, we understand that President Bazoum is uh, detained in his residence. Uh, we call for the immediate release of President Bazoum and for the respect of the rule of law uh, and public safety. Uh, again, Leon, as I uh, said yesterday, this continues to be an evolving situation, and it is uh, quite too soon to characterize uh, the nature of these ongoing developments. But as I said, we continue to monitor the situation quite closely and are in touch with uh, not just uh, officials, but as well as our own uh, embassy personnel uh, as well. But you, you say it's too soon to characterize, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the coup is there. It's happened. Uh, so I don't un quite understand what you're waiting for more. Well, uh, uh, there are some uh, there there are some some important pieces in here. First, uh, uh, President uh, Bazoum is still. Uh, president. He has not uh, resigned. It's also our understanding that uh, the foreign minister, uh, wherever reports to the foreign minister indicating that he is uh, the head of the government. Uh, again, this is a fluid situation and it is too soon to characterize any of these, these kinds of developments. So, Leon, we of course will uh, continue to, to pay close attention and remain in touch with appropriate officials as well as uh, other regional partners as well. Uh, go ahead, Jenny. 
Can you just confirm there is still full accountability for the U.S. Embassy? Are there any plans for an authorized or ordered departure there? And have you seen any signs that Wagner is at all involved in this coup? So we uh, continue to have full accountability of all uh, official personnel and family members. Uh, this uh, obviously is still a developing situation. We've also publicly advised U.S. citizens to limit unnecessary movements, uh, avoid affected areas until further notice as this situation <laughs> develops. Um, I will also note that at this time, Niamey uh, remains calm, and we're continuing to monitor this situation, and we'll provide uh, appropriate information to American citizens um, as the situation continues to progress. Uh, of course, uh, all of this relevant information is also available uh, through our travel advisories, through alerts, and of course on um, travel.state.gov. Uh, as it relates to your second question, I'm not um, uh, aware of any uh, indication that uh, the Wagner Group could could be involved, but I also uh, am not going to speculate or hypothesize from here as the situation uh, continues uh, to be quite fluid. Um, anything else on this before uh, we shift topics? Julia, go ahead. I wanted to ask about the uh, status of the administration's nominee for ambassadorship to Niger, if uh, that is being impacted by Senator Rand Paul's Boulder nominations and how that uh, is affecting uh, on the ground efforts from the embassy. So uh, what, what I will say though, uh, what I will say firstly is that our um, CDA in Niame uh, continues to remain deeply engaged on this and as I just said, had the opportunity to speak with the uh, foreign minister yesterday. That being said, you saw the secretary be quite clear about this and others that it is our hope and desire to have confirmed ambassadors uh, in as many places and in as many capitals as possible. And of course, uh, this also includes Niger. Uh, we have cooperated extensively with Senator Paul uh, by providing him documents and other information, uh, but he continues to block all State Department nominees, uh, the vast majority of whom are career Foreign Service officers, uh, from filling critical national security posts, including, as you so noted, our nominee to serve as ambassador in Niger. Uh, we currently have 65 nominees outstanding with the Senate, including 38 ambassadorial uh, nominees on the Senate floor, awaiting confirmation for posts in Asia, Latin America, Europe, the Middle East and Africa, where U.S. leadership uh, continues to be uh, desperately needed. Holds on State Department nominees are leaving critical posts unfulfilled. Uh, when we don't have ambassadors uh, confirmed in place, our ability to provide leadership, and in too many places of the world, it's impacted. Um, I, I will also just note on a uh, from a human element, uh, we are making a big push to get some of these nominees uh, confirmed and out uh, by the end of this week. If the Senate doesn't confirm them this week, then the senators who continually hold their nominations aren't just depriving our country of having critical uh, diplomatic positions filled and members of its diplomatic team on the field, uh, but they are separating families who already give so much service to this country. Uh, for those uh, families who uh, have nominees that are not be able to be confirmed by the end of this week, um, that leaves serious potential for those that have children, for them to not be able to enroll in appropriate schools uh, starting in September for the upcoming school year at these relevant uh, posts, embassies, and consulates. So uh, it's our uh, strong desire uh, to have uh, confirmed ambassadors uh, in as many places as possible, and we continue to be ready to work with uh, the Senate to do so. Um, anything else on Niger before we uh, move away? On, go ahead. The events there and how will these events affect the U.S. military presence and so I, on, on the role of the Wagner Group, I, uh, Jenny just asked that question oh, right yeah. before you, uh, and I, I will reiterate that I, again, I'm not going to speculate on this situation at this point. We've not seen any uh, indication, um, and uh, as it relates to any force posture or military personnel on the ground, I would just refer to uh, our, our colleagues um, at the Pentagon. I will just, of course, note that uh, Niger um, has been an, an incredible security partner uh, in, on the continent. Um, and so we'll continue to pay close attention to this quite quickly. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, no, no, behind you, sorry. Uh, yes, go I ahead, yeah. I, I oh, okay, go ahead, yeah. So yeah. you can confirm that no uh, 
uh, embassy personnel, non-essential personnel have been moved out of the country at this point? There's been no uh, change in uh, posture at this time, and we continue to have full accountability. And is the State Department doing any contingency planning or talking to DOD about options in case the situation becomes more volatile? So uh, uh, in any situation, we continuously adjust our posture at embassies and consulates throughout the world in line with, uh, of course, the local security environment and other factors. Uh, I'm certainly not going to get into the deliberative and ongoing processes around this, but we'll continue to monitor the situation and make uh, appropriate adjustments uh, as necessary. For now, I would reiterate again that we continue to have full accountability. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Christina. Thanks, Christina yeah. Rufino, CBS. I've yep. harassed your predecessors, but don't think I've had the pleasure yet. Um, Welcome. Thanks. Uh, I want to ask you about passports. Okay. And uh, I just want to start off by saying, I mean, do you, do you think it's acceptable that it's taking Americans at least 12 weeks, and often cases longer, to get a critical U.S. government document? So uh, w what I would just say first from a broad point of view is that the demand for passports has been greater uh, than it's ever been. Uh, earlier uh, in calendar year 2023, we uh, were receiving up to 560,000 applications a week. Uh, volumes uh, have certainly tapered, uh, but remain above levels uh, at the same point uh, pre-pandemic, uh, which began in fiscal year 2019. Uh, our processing times are an accurate reflection of the current demand. But what I will also note is that the State Department uh, is taking uh, appropriate steps, uh, any steps that we can to try and uh, not only expedite processing, but also, of course, uh, enhance our capacity to do so. I've seen uh, some, uh, I would say, misreporting and misinformation out there that uh, department passport adjudicators um, have been teleworking or things to that effect, uh, that is uh, simply uh, not the case. The passport adjudicators have been back in the office since June of 2020, and we have increased staffing levels uh, and have hundreds of additional staff in the hiring pipeline. We've also um, had staff work tens of thousands of hours of overtime uh, a month. In fact, uh, from January through August, uh, we have authorized approximately 30,000 to 40,000 overtime hours each month, and we have volunteers across the department working uh, on surge things. Um, I, this, the, the, the post-pandemic spike in passport demand uh, from Americans uh, it truly is unprecedented, and we will be on track to issue more passports this year than in any previous year, but we're also taking steps to ensure uh, that um, uh, we can meet this demand as well. But if you could go ahead and answer the question, do you think that 12 weeks is an acceptable turnaround time? Are you saying that the system is working well enough at capacity? It is a reflection of the demand, uh, and our current processing times are about 10 to 13 weeks for routine processing and seven to nine weeks for expedited processing. Right, but you said you guys have taken steps to try to mitigate this, but in the last couple of months, the, the timeline has gotten longer, right? It was six to nine weeks, now it's up to 13 weeks. So that seems to be going the wrong direction. So what do you need to fix this? How do you get it to a more acceptable turnaround time? Because you know we're talking to people who say like it's really hard to plan your life out 12 weeks in advance. People don't always know they're going to need this. Cer certainly uh, understand uh, the, the the importance that passports play, especially as individuals plan out their uh, travel, whether it be for personal purposes, whether it be for emergency situations, and so have you. Uh, I think an important thing to note is that uh, this is a line of effort that we have uh, continuously taken steps to turn back on. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, this is something that had fallen uh, completely to zero, just given the state of the world and the state of affairs. I would also remind this room that uh, passport operations are one of the few uh, aspects of the federal government that are self-funding. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, going to be a turning uh, of a dial a little bit, not uh, exactly flipping a switch, uh, but the State Department certainly understands the seriousness of this. Uh, and that's why we are, uh, not just surging staff, uh, surging overtime hours, but we're also thinking through ways in which we can uh, make this process easier and more accessible for Americans. As you probably know, Christina, we ran a limited uh, online passport renewal process uh, as a pilot in the early parts of 2022, uh, uh, from early parts of 2022 through the early parts of 23. Uh, in that time, we processed and issued uh, more than 560 
thousand, 65,000 uh, passports through an online system. Uh, we've surveyed customers who are part of that, and we look forward to making improvements based on that feedback and formally launching this uh, portal uh, at the tail end of 2023. So uh, this is certainly, we understand the demand signal that we're getting from the American people, and we stand ready to not just um, continue to make adjustments, but also make improvements in this process. And just really quickly, I don't want to eat up too much of my colleague's yeah. time, but there's legislation on the Hill being put forward by Senator Langford that he says would address some of the issues, including staffing and turnaround time. Do you Are you aware of that legislation, and do you have a response? So uh, <laughs> lots of great, important ideas coming from Congress to tend to avoid commenting on active legislation. But uh, of course, on the issues of passports, we know that uh, our, our, our partners in Congress are an important piece of that equation, and we look forward to engaging with them as we uh, continue to work on this very important issue. All right, uh, Jenny, go ahead. Thank you, Burden. Uh, I have two questions on North Korea. Sure. On uh, today is the uh, on the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice Day, but the Russian Defense Minister and Chinese delegations visited North Korea, as you know that, and delivered the personal letters from. Putin and the Xi Jinping to Kim Jong Un in Pyongyang. They strongly committed to military cooperation. This happened. Do you think North Korea denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula will be difficult? Well, what I can say, uh, Jani, is that one, that our commitment to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula uh, <coughs> continues to be unwavering, uh, as well as our uh, willingness to engage with Pyongyang uh, without preconditions. But uh, Pyongyang has uh, continuously uh, not uh, been interested in, in, in diplomatic engagements back. Uh, the DPRK's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile program, they pro pose a grave threat to uh, international peace and security and stand in blatant violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. You just spoke of two countries, Russia and China. Uh, Russia's support for these unlawful weapons uh, programs uh, by blocking additional action at the UN Security Council, by participating in events in Pyongyang celebrating these weapons, by failing to crack down on DPRK sanction invasion activities. Uh, all of this just highlights how detrimental it has become to preserving uh, international peace and security. I will also note is that we've previously said we believe that Beijing has influence over Pyongyang and we hope that it will use that influence to encourage Pyongyang to return to dialogue and refrain from destabilizing activities. Yeah, uh, Kim Jong-un and the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu pledged military cooperation between the two countries and they discussed the purchase of weapons from North Korea while accompanying them to the ICBM and the new weapons showroom in Pyongyang. How concerned are you about this? Because we continue to be uh, incredibly concerned. Uh, look, the DPRK's support for Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, whether through public statements, whether through arms transfers we've previously discussed, uh, all of this clearly illustrates its destabilizing and irresponsible role uh, in international affairs. At the okay. king, private king, last sure. question, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, our limited uh, dialogue between the U.S. and North Korea expected or? I just don't have uh, any updates for you on that at this time. Uh, Private King's well-being continues to be uh, an extremely high priority for the State Department. We're continuing to coordinate with the interagency on this. Thank you. Said, go ahead. Thank you. Switching yeah. topics. Sure. To the I have a couple of questions uh, on the Palestinian issue and the, on the visa waiver. Um, Israeli far-right uh, minister Ben Gavir today stormed the Luxa, causing your allies like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Turkey to condemn the action. And I wonder if you would do the same. Would the United States condemn such an act? Said, we absolutely are concerned by today's visit to the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem. We uh, reaffirm our longstanding U.S. position that in support of the historic status quo at Jerusalem's holy sites, and we underline Jordan's special role uh, in uh, Muslim holy sites in Jerusalem. Uh, you've heard me say this before, that any unilateral action or rhetoric that deviates or jeopardizes the status quo uh, is, is completely unacceptable. Uh, on the visa waiver, uh -huh. switching uh, gears here, 
Uh, there are widely circulating uh, copies of the U.S. Israeli MOU that was signed, you know, a, a week ago or so, and reports citing it. Do you intend to make to make it public? Uh, are you going to publish the MOU so people know what the United States government and Israel have agreed to? Americans would know. Uh, Said, I, I we we talk about the visa waiver program pretty regularly for the past couple of weeks. Right. Um, I think an important perspective and thing to remember here is that this is an ongoing process and that we're looking forward to continuing to work with uh, our Israeli partners uh, on ensuring that uh, any requirements and prerequisites are met uh, prior to uh, any uh, potential uh, entry uh, into the program. Uh, we also fully expect that the Israeli government will further modify its regulations and public facing guidance uh, in the coming days and weeks to fully uh, reflect uh, adherence to any prerequisites, but also uh, adherence to the so, program. So, but there are no plans to publish it uh, in, in the near future, as correct. far as you know. Correct. Okay. Uh, my other question is that the Israeli uh, government's uh, public-facing guidance directs some U.S. citizens to use a smart application, uh, which was developed by the Israeli military, and its terms of service include permissions for accessing locations, phone files, and so on. Has the State Department or any U.S. government agency conducted a cybersecurity review of this application? Have you done that uh, to to see you know what U.S. citizens are subject to? Said, I, I, I mean, I, you, you may have to take this question. But Said, I, but within uh, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't speak be able to speak to any uh, the specificity of any review from up here. But what I will just note is that um, for American citizens. Um, traveling uh, not just uh, in uh, Israel and the uh, proximate regions, but also anywhere in the world uh, okay. on travel.state.gov. We have very clear uh, recommendations on what our official State Department um, policies are as it relates to interfacing with uh, the appropriate visa or adjudicating mechanism in any country that uh, grants access. So okay. I would refer you to that, but I'm not aware of or would I speak to any specific review of this act. Could you look into it, see me, you know, what is your position on I'm, this? I'm because happy they are to. prying into the security of, of I'm, American I'm, citizens. I'm happy to. Alex, go ahead. Thanks, Alex. A couple of questions. Uh, the President's decision about the ICC and cooperation with ICC, uh, could you just tell us, you know, uh, what is going on on your end? What does the traffic look like? Have you guys already started transferring data? to ICC, and where is Ambassador Van Schaak these days? So, uh, Alex, it certainly, and uh, you saw the Secretary speak a little bit to this yesterday in Wellington, uh, it would not uh, get into the specifics of this, just given the uh, legal, prosecutorial, and investigatory implications. Uh, so, we'll, but to, let me take a step back. Since the beginning of Russia's assault on Ukraine, uh, the President has been clear that there needs to be accountability for the perpetrators and enablers of the war crime and atrocities in Ukraine. Uh, and Secretary Blinken uh, reiterated this yesterday, that we have made clear that there needs to be accountability, um, and we support the ICC's investigation. Uh, we support a range of international efforts to identify and hold to account those responsible, including through the Ukrainian uh, Prosecutor General, the Joint Investigative Team, uh, the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission, and others. Uh, we have deployed teams of international investigators and prosecutors to assist Ukraine's Office of the Prosecutor General in documenting, preserving, and preparing uh, war crime cases for prosecution. Uh, and the Department of Justice has also entered an MOU to cooperate uh, with Ukraine on investigations and prosecutions of war crimes committed during Russia's invasion. Ambassador Van Schaak, of course, is uh, deeply engaged and uh, deeply part of this uh, process uh, and will continue to be uh, working closely, not just with the Secretary, but across the interagency uh, on these efforts. And I also intended to uh, transfer materials about the Wagner Group. Um, Alex, that. I'm just not going to get into the specifics of the kinds of flow of information and the specificity of the cooperation. Thank you. Related to that, any um, reaction to the precaution? being spotted at uh, St. Petersburg today at the Russia uh, African Union summit? Uh, I, 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 I don't really have a comment on that specifically, uh, Alex. The, the whole situation continues to be uh, uh, somewhat uh, puzzling um, uh, to all of us. But, but what I will just 
if you'll allow me, speak to the um, broader Russia-Africa summit, if I'll just note that you know the U.S.'s uh, uh, Africa policy is about Africa. And uh, I will remind you all that uh, earlier uh, this year, or late last year, sorry, we hosted 46 leaders from across North and Sub-Saharan Africa at the U.S. Africa Leader Summit, which highlighted our commitment to uh, expanding and deepening our partnership with African uh, countries, institutions, and people. Uh, we also condemn uh, Russia's unilateral withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Uh, we join the Secretary General in expressing our disappointment that Russia refused the UN's proposals to keep uh, the initiative alive. And while we're on the topic of food security, which I know is something that is so critically important to many of these countries uh, attending this summit and the African continent writ large, uh, as the Secretary said yesterday, the United States uh, supports approximately half of the budget of the World Food Program, whereas Russia is only uh, 0.02%. Uh, and so it's pretty clear to us uh, who is actively uh, committed um, to uh, addressing uh, the dire concerns of food security. And lastly, if you'll just allow me, Alex, it surely does not take a uh, mathematician to see that uh, compared to 2022, the number of countries attending this uh, Russian-Africa summit uh, is far less uh, than it was the year before. Uh, and this is just a further testament to the egregious global implications of Russia's unjust uh, assault on Ukraine and how from everything like uh, food security to global trade prices and things like that have impacted uh, countries around the world, not just uh, in the immediate vicinity of Eastern Europe. Thank you. My, my last question, if you don't mind, sure. is about that. Uh, sure. yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead you, you have an air, the Russian president offered to, at the summit, several countries offered to several African countries to to uh, give uh, grain uh, free for free, um, bypassing uh, the greens. Do you have a re reaction to that? Uh, actions certainly uh, uh, should speak louder than words uh, in any situation, including addressing the uh, the global threat of, of food security. What I will just note and reiterate, as I said, is that currently uh, Russia provides 0.02% uh, of the World Food Program's budget, and the United States uh, provides about half. Uh, so you know the numbers uh, clearly don't lie uh, when it comes to who in here is actually committed uh, to addressing uh, the, the crisis of food security. Uh, but broadly, on, on President Putin's comments, um, actions speak louder than words. Uh, I'm going to work through them, Alex. You've got like four questions in already. Please come back to me later. I'll think about it. Go ahead, Gita. Thanks, Gita. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, Russia using Iranian uh -huh. UAVs, but it, uh, it seems like Bolivia is not inter is interested in Iran's UAVs. Um, the president of Bolivia has reportedly said that he wants it for border security uh, protection, but given the um, U.S. sanctions against um, many different organizations and companies working in Iran's UAV protection um, sector, would, would the reason that Bolivia is stating that it needs, it wants the UAVs exempted from those sanctions, and is it advisable? So, Gita, obviously, this is something that is um, uh, is concerning, and we're closely monitoring any efforts by Iran to uh, expand its influence in the Western Hemisphere, and we take seriously any efforts by other countries uh, who are interested in deepening uh, military partnerships with Iran uh, or procure uh, Iranian UAVs. We strongly urge uh, all nations to avoid engaging in transactions with Iran for military equipment or related items, uh, which could subject entities and individuals to multiple U.S. sanctions authorities. Uh, we, of course, remain open to forging stronger bilateral relationships uh, with the Bolivian government in areas of mutual interest, uh, potentially even uh, border security, migration, things uh, of that space. Uh, but on this specific topic, uh, we, of course, would take quite seriously any effort by any country to deepen uh, military partnerships with, uh, with Iran or procure uh, Iranian UAVs. Does the administration have the uh, kind of relationship with Bolivia to dissuade it? Uh, I'm just not going to uh, get into the specifics of the kind of diplomatic uh, engagements that we uh, can and uh, may have uh, as it relates to this, beyond just reiterating that this, of course, would be uh, of uh, increasingly concern to us. Yeah.
Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Bangladesh situation is turning into confrontation. The opposition BNP shifted their ground rally from July 27 to next day Friday. The Sheikh Hasina-led ruling party Bangladesh Awami League is hosting counter-political -polit meetings considering coinciding the opposition meeting as an apparent insight of violence on the street. The state apparatus work over time to obstruct the opposition rally while facilitating the counter program by ruling party. The police alone have arrested thousands of opposition activists as the opposition party claimed. So how you are evaluating this confrontational situation in Bangladesh as the regime is inciting violence? In so the street? So I, I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, and you've been, been very clear. I've been very clear about this. I will reiterate that political violence has uh, no place in a democracy. And the United States, we favor no political party. We support uh, Bangladesh's goal of holding free, fair, and uh, peaceful elections. Uh, we've also emphasized the importance of uh, the United States and Bangladesh working together to achieve this goal, uh, and certainly continue to believe that uh, this endeavor has no space or room for uh, political violence. DR, go ahead. A uh, couple questions on Iraq and the region. The sure. first on your sanctions on Iraqi bankers, as this has triggered protests in Iraq and Iraqi denial devaluation. Why you sanctioned those Iraqi bankers, and have you issued a new warning to Iraq on the dollar cash flow to the neighboring countries in Iraq? So to, to take a step back and to be quite clear, uh, we did not sanction these 14 banks. Uh, earlier in July, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York removed 14 banks from access to the Central Bank of Iraq's foreign currency sale window, known as the dollar and wire auctions. Uh, these actions help limit the ability of bad actors seeking to launder US dollars profit from the exploitation of money owned by the Iraqi people and evade U.S. sanctions. Um, I will also note that corruption poses a challenge for Iraq's uh, banking sector. Uh, our government and the government of Iraq are working together to tackle this challenge head on. Prime Minister Sudani is taking the integrity of the Iraqi uh, financial system quite seriously. And all of these actions uh, are happening in uh, close coordination and harmony with the Prime Minister's vision uh, and his uh, identification uh, and his identifying of fighting corruption and modernizing uh, Iraq's financial sector. And yesterday I asked this question, I'll ask again about the reforms in the Kishman, Ministry of Kashmir of Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, have you, have you told the Kurdish leaders to appoint an interim Peshmerga minister before September, and what's your view on the reforms process in the Peshmerga? So our, our, our colleagues at the Department of Defense can certainly speak more about the uh, memor of an, memorandum of understanding that was um, signed, but we continue to have concerns of the uh, impact of internal Kurdish divisions uh, uh, on the pace of uh, Peshmerga reform and uh, readiness uh, and we have communicated these concerns to senior KRG uh, leaders as well. And last question on, sure. on, on the Russian provocation in Syria. Uh, are, you, are you going to push back against this Russian provocation against your drones in northeast Syria? So I spoke a little bit about this uh, earlier in the week, and I would just reiterate again what the uh, Pentagon and the White House said, that uh, these actions by Russia, they violated established protocols and international norms, uh, and that we strongly urge Russian forces in Syria to immediately stop reckless and threatening uh, behavior. And we will, uh, of course, take any appropriate action uh, to keep uh, uh, our service members or to keep uh, civilians uh, in the region safe. Go ahead. So touching uh, briefly on the China's influence in the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, recently we've been seeing a, an, a, a desperate amount of uh, erosion of democracy within Solomon Islands, uh, one being that the uh, the governor, uh, the former governor of the Malaita province, the biggest province within the Solomon Islands, um, Daniel Suidani, being sacked uh, by the government for essentially going against the one China policy. And in fact, um, the uh, there's there's a delay in the election elections uh, where um, the Pacific Games are are taking taking in place when when the election should be going on. Um, there's also a security pact uh, between Solomon Islands um, and and China, and there's uh, reports of policing stations being um, operating um, in in the island itself. So 
uh, with, with the continual growth of the Chinese Communist Party's presence in the Solomon Islands and overall um, it becoming a, a, it seems like it's becoming a, a, a concern, uh, especially for our allies around the region, particularly it seems like for Australia, uh, among, among many others. I was, I was just wondering if we can uh, comment on that. What I would just say is that uh, we, uh, as it relates to our relationship with the, the Solomon Islands or any country, uh, we do not ask uh, countries uh, to choose between the United States and the PRC. We uh, offer them uh, a choice and uh, offer to them what a partnership uh, what the United States could uh, look like and what that could mean for the people of, of both of our countries. And that continues uh, to be the case um, uh, in the Solomon Islands and the Indo-Pacific region broadly. There are a number of uh, issues, core issues, uh, that are the nexus of our relationship with um, many, uh, all of these uh, Pacific Island countries. The Secretary uh, in the past three months um, has been to the region um, quite consistently, uh, raising, discussing some of these issues, uh, deepening our cooperation in a number of areas, whether it be security, climate change, uh, energy cooperation, uh, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and so that is the foot that the United States is going to continue to put forward um, uh, and, and deepening our, our, our bilateral ties and relations on a number of these issues. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. One is just follow up to the other's question. There will be any additional sanctions on Iraqi banks. This has created instability in the Iraqi market. And Certainly, I'm not going to preview any, um, any actions that the U.S. government might potentially oh. take. Okay, the, the second question is about Iraqi Kurdistan parliamentary elections. The Kurdistan uh, region presidency has proposed February 25th as the day for parliamentary elections in the, in the region after they have been delayed for a year, for over a year. What's your view on this? Uh, I'm gonna have to check in on that, and we'll we'll make sure to follow up with you and get back to that. Julie, you have your hand up patiently. Um, the House Intelligence Committee just released the unclassified uh, ODNI assessment, showing that China is helping Russia evade and circumvent Western sanctions, and is probably supplying Russia with key technology and equipment in war in Ukraine. Um, what? possible recourse options are available. What, is, what does the State Department have to say about uh, China assisting Russia in evading these sanctions? Well, so first on this specific report, um, I've, not, I've not seen it, so I'm not going to um, uh, comment on that. But uh, in every uh, engagement that the Secretary and, uh, the, uh, and others have had with uh, PRC officials, uh, we have made uh, quite clear uh, our concern uh, should uh, the provision of lethal aid, should uh, steps be taken to uh, allow Russia to further um, its aggression into Ukraine, and we have continued to make that uh, very clear uh, through all appropriate channels. Now, and any potential actions, I'm certainly not gonna preview uh, from here as the, we, we don't preview US actions, um, but this is something that of course we're gonna continue to monitor closely and pay, uh, pay close attention to. Jenny, you your hand up. Uh, yeah. Have there been any efforts to get consular access to Evan Grishkovich in recent weeks, and have those uh, requests been granted by Moscow? And then Putin signed a law earlier this week banning gender-affirming care. I was wondering if the state has any comment or if there's anything you can do for these marginalized communities. Sure. So first, um, we continue to call for the release of uh, wrongful detainee Evan Gershkovitz as well as uh, wrongful detainee uh, Paul uh, Whalen. Uh, we obviously fairly consistently uh, ask uh, for uh, appropriate consular access that is consistent with uh, our consular convention with the Russian Federation. I'm not aware of a, uh, of a specific date or the last uh, point of contact, but I'm happy to, to check with the team and, and get back to you on that. Uh, specifically on this second law, uh, this your second question on this law about uh, Russia banning uh, gender-affirming care, um, quite directly, uh, uh, I believe this law is uh, repressive. It increases uh, the risk of violence uh, against uh, these marginalized communities. Uh, targeting members of vulnerable communities for repression, such as the LGBTQI plus uh, community, is a uh, favored tool of uh, the Kremlin's hands, handbook. Um, it is uh, a tactic, I, I believe, being used to distract 
from uh, the Russian government's uh, economic and policy failures. Uh, and we uh, quite clearly condemn this law, as well as other laws in Russia around the world that attempt to demonize uh, LGBTQI uh, plus uh, people. Uh, we firmly oppose any discrimination or abuses against uh, these marginalized uh, communities. Can I follow up on that really quickly? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, given that uh, many U.S. states are passing their own laws to restrict and ban gender affirming care, uh, how does that affect the State Department's ability to, to characterize uh, Russia's law as repressive? Given well, that it's happening in the United States. I, 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 I certainly appreciate your question. Uh, the, uh, I think your question is more uh, better suited for uh, a, a domestic facing uh, agency. Uh, I think we have been incredibly clear uh, about the values of, uh, uh, of this department, uh, the, the values that we uh, try to um, uh, live and uh, live by and conduct our bilateral relationships through as Secretary Blinken um, has been pretty clear for the United States human rights uh, are, are, are always on the table uh, and these are some things that when uh, we see impacted or marginalized or uh, targeted uh, we're going to raise those uh, directly with um, foreign governments with foreign officials uh, in, in countries uh, around the world. Um, Can I ask a Russian question? Um, I'm gonna go to Michelle. Okay, one of you. Go ahead, Michelle. I have yeah. two questions yeah. on Lebanon. Uh, France is a special envoy for Lebanon. Uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian was in Lebanon to press the parties to elect a new president. Uh, are you uh, in full coordination with France uh, on uh, this issue? And do you support uh, France's approach to the Lebanese matter? So our joint statement earlier in July uh, from Doha underscored that we uh, continue to work closely with our partners, including France, uh, to urge Lebanese officials to elect a president from a form of government and uh, implement uh, appropriate critical reforms as well. And did you get any updates? Uh, I, I don't have any updates on Second, that. Lebanese Central Bank governor will retire this week with no replacement in the horizon. Are you concerned about uh, the vacuum that this uh, retirement uh, will create? The, 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 on the central bank, uh, uh, the current governor has announced that he's not going to uh, extend uh, his position after the end of the month, and ultimately it's up for the Lebanese government to determine who is in that position. We will work with uh, the appropriate designated uh, governor uh, in their uh, official capacity. Go ahead in the back. Thank you. Yeah. I have a couple of questions on Ukraine. Um, on Saturday, one of my colleagues from Russian news agency, Rostislav Zhuravlov, was killed in a Ukrainian strike and four more journalists were injured. Preliminary reports show that the strike was conducted with uh, cluster munitions. In your view, does this use of cluster munitions uh, constitute an appropriate use as promised by Kiev last week? So uh, I'm not aware of those specific reports. Uh, obviously, the uh, uh, safety of journalists um, and those in the media uh, reporting in conflict zones uh, should certainly uh, be uh, respected. Uh, but I would also uh, note and remind you that uh, we continue um, to be in this situation and have this conversation because of uh, Russia's uh, unjust, uh, illegal war into Ukraine and its efforts to uh, erase uh, Ukrainian borders, its efforts to completely violate and ignore uh, uh, the rules that are very clearly uh, laid out uh, in the UN Charter. And I have one more on the Black Sea Grain sure. initiative. According to the UN data, only 10% of, of, uh, of grain was actually sent to African countries while the lion's share was sent to China, Spain, Turkey, Italy, and the Netherlands. In light of this, in light of this data, do you still believe that the Grain Initiative benefited the poorest countries? Uh, the Black Sea Grain Initiative uh, benefited uh, the world. Uh, uh, it had a direct impact on global food prices. In the immediate aftermath of uh, Russia's withdrawal, we already saw and are continuing to see global food prices um, uh, rise. Uh, 
uh, of course, we want to ensure that grain is going to all the countries uh, uh, possible that are needed, but this is uh, not just a regional issue. Uh, to Eastern Europe, to Africa, to where it is a global issue. Uh, the Ukrainian food and grain products are incredibly uh, important uh, to not just global uh, demands, but global supply chains. Uh, and the Black Sea Grain Initiative uh, was uh, an important boon uh, in that aspect. And we continue to call on Russia to, to rejoin it. All right, thanks everybody.